right, today is the third Sunday of Lent at Christian Chapel. We observe and participate in Lent. It's the 40 days preceding Easter. Uh, it's a time where the church sets aside some intentional rhythms and practices to build an awareness in our lives of the sacrifice Jesus has made for us and the new life that he offers to us. So uh, some of us have chosen to give up certain things as a reminder of the sacrifice of Jesus. Others have chosen to pick up new behaviors as a way to remember the new life he has brought. Uh, but regardless of what we're doing, our motivation behind it is not to kind of score religious points make God love us more, try to manipulate him to doing what we really want. Uh, But it's just really to slow down and remember who Jesus is and what he's accomplished and the difference it makes in our life. It also prepares us for the celebration of Easter, where it's not just something that shows up uh, out of the blue, but something we've really put some intentional time and effort into preparing and getting ready for. Uh, This year during Lent at Christian Chapel, we've been talking about how Jesus came to bring us whole life wholeness. And so we started two weeks ago by uh, talking about spiritual wholeness, how we can't ever want something from Jesus more than we want Jesus himself. And we can never experience any of these other um, forms of wholeness until we are made whole spiritually. That, that it's from life with Christ that every other form of wholeness flows. And then our plan uh, was to walk through each of these kind of week by week and talk about what the scriptures teach us. We did that last week with vocational wholeness. Today was supposed to be the day we talked about financial wholeness. Um, and, and yet kind of as the, the events of the week progressed, that seemed to be um, something that God was directing us in a, a different direction to. Uh, seemed like it would be a little tone deaf this morning to just get up and talk about money uh, in, in light of our, our current situation and events. So today instead we're going to talk about do not fear. We're going to press pause on that Lent series. We'll come back to it. Um, the good news is, I mean good news for me at least, is uh, I've got like a finished sermon ready to go. So, so at some point, uh, you know, that'll get rolled back out. In fact, um, we hosted an event here at Christian Chapel on Tuesday for pastors from around Oklahoma. It was a, a training seminar to uh, teach us about some new resources that we could use to um, improve the depth of our Bible study, improve our access to other resources with the goal of improving our teaching and our preaching. And I sat kind of at a table back over here by the doors with a couple of our staff members. And the the guy who was presenting, he kept making jokes about pastors who write their sermons on Saturdays, uh, you know, Saturday morning, Saturday night, called them the Saturday night special. He had had all kinds of jokes that went with it. Um, And I was honestly a little offended by it of like, hey, look. Pastors get a bad enough rap for being lazy without you attacking all of us here and then trying to get us to buy your stuff. Like, this is not going well for you. Um, and I might have even made some, some snide, condescending comments to my coworkers seated on each side of me of pastors who write their sermons on Saturdays are bad at their jobs. And other miscellaneous comments along those same lines. And so, uh, you know, for, for me, most weeks I'm, I'm done by Wednesday morning. And uh, this week, almost as if to mess with me a little bit, I didn't get to finish till Thursday late afternoon. Um, and then Friday, I was hanging out with Angie, and we were just talking about, you know, the coronavirus and all this different stuff. And it was changing the way we were going to be able to do some of our things here at church on Friday. And about Friday night, about 730, I think I finally broke down and told her, I really think God is directing me to a new sermon for Sunday. Which means yesterday I was that guy I had made fun of all day Tuesday, holed up all morning and afternoon at my house, um, upstairs in the game room while my kids kept coming by and saying, are you done yet? You said we were going to rent a movie. You said we were going to, it's like, just, just give me, just give me a minute. Um, So, so we're going to do that this morning. We're going to, going to shift gears, press pause, and just kind of talk a little bit about the current situation in our world and what we believe God is saying to us in this season. So, uh, I know even even this morning, uh, there are different reactions, you know, so our um, our online numbers are way up today, a uh, number of people streaming, because and, and some of it is, is incredibly legitimate, like people who are uh, immunocompromised, people who've been struggling with different sicknesses for a while, that's good, that's worth, there's no judgment at all, and then there's a group of you here who are feeling very proud of yourselves this morning, right? Just, you don't have to admit it, I can see it in your eyes, 
of like, nah, some people canceled, not me, I'm here. You know, you're sticking it to the man. Uh, so, so good for you. Uh, but regardless of kind of how you feel this morning, my hope for us is to, to just really kind of stop and say, Lord, what are you saying to us from the scriptures about where we are and what's going on in our world right now? So um, we're not going to not going to dive into the origins of the coronavirus or COVID-19, if you are more technical, or the Wuhan province or travel restrictions or any of the other things that y'all have been posting too much about on Facebook and other forms of social media. Instead, we're going to turn to the scriptures and we're going to look at one particular passage in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. The Apostle Paul gives us some very clear instructions on our relationship to fear as followers of Jesus. So I'm going to read it to you, but uh, we're actually going to read through it in uh, six different translations this morning. Now, the, the reason I'm doing that is not to try to confuse you, not to make you think that uh, the Bible does not speak with a unified voice, but instead to give you a, a deeper and broader understanding. So if, if you've never spent a lot of time thinking about Scripture translation and how we get stuff from ancient Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic into English, uh, here's a 30-second summary of it. Basically, every time there's a translation of the Bible that comes out, there's a group of scholars who have spent a lifetime preparing to be part of those teams. They spend years together discerning how to translate into a particular language or a particular version of a language. And then they kind of work through the Bible word by word. And what you find is that for many uh, ancient Hebrew and Greek and Aramaic words, there are no direct correlations for an English word today. So a, a lot of times what they're looking for is what is the best word in our language that most accurately describes this original word in, in Greek or in Hebrew and Aramaic. So, um, you know, that's why you will read in different translations and it'll sound slightly different. Now, we still believe the scriptures are inspired. We believe in their original form and their original languages. They are without error, without contradiction. And yet sometimes we can read different passages and we think, Do, did those people look at the same thing, because they seem to come to different um, conclusions. But what we actually find is if, if we read, like we're going to this morning, several different ones, we wind up with a more well-rounded view and a deeper understanding of what a particular passage is saying. So that's my hope this morning, is that you will hear uh, the congruency between each of the translations, but that in the, the differences, you will also see how we are able to kind of look at different words from different angles, and the end result is a more robust understanding of exactly what the Spirit inspires. Paul to write first to Timothy and now to us as well. Okay, so 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, we're going to read first from the New Century Version. God did not give us a spirit that makes us afraid, but a spirit of power and love and self-control. The English Standard Version says, For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. The New International Version says, For the Spirit God gave us does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. The New King James Version of you, for those of you who've wondered if I will ever read from the correct version of the Bible, says, not just kidding, I don't get those emails, um, and please don't start. Uh, but it says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. God's word, God's word translation says God didn't give us a cowardly spirit, but a spirit of power, love, and good judgment. And finally, the contemporary English version says God's spirit doesn't make cowards out of us. The spirit gives us power, love, and self-control. All right, so, so we're going to come back to some of those. There, there are some consistencies um, you know, and, and then there's some areas where we can see it from different angles. We'll talk about those as we go. But the, the first thing we see is that Paul has this command, this instruction to Timothy of God does not give you a spirit of fear. God does not make you afraid. Now, why would he write that? So, so we've got to understand who Timothy is and the situation he faces. Timothy is a, a younger minister that has been placed in charge of a church. And for Timothy, there are a lot of reasons for him to be afraid. He's a pastor in an environment that is hostile to pastors. The first century Roman Empire is not the most comfortable place to be a Christian. 
They're in their beginning stages of persecuting the church. It will accelerate during Timothy's lifetime. It will ultimately result in his mentor Paul's martyrdom, the martyrdom probably of other people he knows. And so there is a real fear of, hey, the things that are starting to happen might continue to happen. Timothy also had reason to be afraid because of some of the situations he faced in his own church. There were false teachers who were coming in. They were creating division. Uh, They were causing defection. And so Paul is writing to Timothy and telling him, you've got to take a strong stand against these men and women for the sake of the gospel. And that's a big task for a young man. He's probably being called to people who have uh, been part of the church longer than him, who are older than him, who are more respected in the community. And Paul's saying, stand up for them for the sake, stand up to them for the sake of the gospel. And then Timothy can also be afraid because Paul is repeatedly telling uh, the people he mentors and the people in the church he plants, follow me as I follow Christ. And when they look at Paul's life, what they see is, so you're saying, I want to be like you. You are shipwrecked. You are beaten. You are arrested. You are threatened with death. You've almost died a couple times. And you're saying the same awaits me, but that's okay because the reward on the other side is greater. So it's understandable for Timothy to experience a little bit of fear. In the same way, it's understandable for you and I to experience fear. Now, what I I do not want you to hear this morning is that if you ever feel fear, you don't have faith. Because that's not it at all, right? Paul does not tell Timothy, you should not feel fear because you have a spirit of power, love, and self-discipline. Instead, he makes a distinction and says, God has not given you a spirit of fear. So as a follower of Christ, it's okay for me to feel afraid, but I'm not going to be captive to that fear. I'm not going to let it take up residence inside of me. And and why is that important? Well, it's important for a couple reasons. First of all, fear always snowballs, right? If you, it's one thing to feel afraid, but when you start to give into that spirit of fear, it starts to snowball and you're afraid of a little thing and then it turns into a bigger thing and then it turns into a bigger thing. And then some of you have already had this experience this week. You clicked on one story about the coronavirus and by the time you got to the end 30 minutes later, we all might as well be dead, right? Because that's what, I mean, there, there are legitimate scholarly articles out there written saying this is what a worst case scenario could look like. And it's scary. And if you go down that road, your fear snowballs over and over and over again. And and that's kind of tied with with one of the, the other ways that fear works is for us, sometimes the more information we have, the more ammunition the enemy has to make us afraid. Not a temporary feeling of fear, but this kind of deep and abiding foreboding of it's not going to be okay, right? And, and that's, that is always been the case, but is even more pronounced now because you and I have access to know what's happening almost everywhere, almost all the time, right? Like some of you are currently more aware of the health of Tom Hanks than you are your own grandmother's. You know, because what's a world without Woody? Is it worth living in? I don't know. Maybe not. But he survived on an island once. He probably will again. You know, and, and so we, we but, but we have all this information and it's just kind of like, what do, I, what do I do with this? And the response for a lot of us is, I get afraid. I get worried. I get concerned about it. But the, the problem, the, the thing we really want to understand is that initial feeling of fear is fine. It's a natural, normal human response to feel afraid when something catches you by surprise, something catches you off guard, or you're facing some kind of uncertainty or risk or threat. That's natural. But what Paul tells us is in that season, we will not give in to a spirit of fear because that is not the spirit that God has given to us. Now, why is it is it so important for us to be aware that, that we don't give in to the spirit of fear. I think there's a, a couple things we need to understand. First of all, fear shrinks our view of God, right? So, so when you start to give in to a spirit of fear, when you allow fear to take up residence in your heart and your mind, it begins to magnify the size of your, the things you're afraid of. And correspondingly, it shrinks your view of God. To where if, if you keep kind of going down this snowball route, by the end, you are pretty sure God doesn't see you, know you, love you, or have a plan for you. Or if he did, your fears are now too big for him to manage. 
And so the enemy knows one of the ways that he can take away our faith is by filling our hearts with fear. Fear of the unknown, fear of what might could be, fear of the worst case scenarios. The other thing we have to understand is, is fear makes us selfish. And when you're afraid, your, your first response is, what is best for me right now? Like we just look at it through that lens of how does this affect me and what is my best course of action? So this, if you don't think we do this, if you don't think fear makes us selfish, go try to buy toilet paper after church today. All right? And what are you going to find? That, that it's empty of all the things to be out of. What, I mean, that's a whole nother conversation of what does that say about our, my greatest fear in life is not having toilet paper. Like forget, I mean, you can buy soap. You can buy all the soap you want, but you can't, okay. Anyways, makes us selfish. We get that. We see that. Why? Because fear turns our attention away from God, and when our attention is turned away from God, our attention is turned away from others, and it all is focused on ourselves. and we become very, very selfish. And so you hear this even in, in conversations this week where the primary concern is not how does this affect others. The primary concern is how does this affect me, right? What am I going to do without March Madness? For real, what am I going to do without March Madness? Like, do you, there's no other, and anytime I tell my wife this, she reminds me, fear makes us selfish, like you right now, right? And, and it's this wonderful, so it, it, it makes us selfish. It also stops our forward movement. When you become afraid of something and you really fixate on it, it it causes you to stop paying attention to all of the other things that you're supposed to be doing in life. I mean, think of it this way. Anybody, do you have the the person in your family or in your house that likes to scare other people? Anybody? Maybe you are that person. Who is that person? Who's the one that jumps out, right? You jump out behind doors, behind, you think it's hilarious. Uh, Like in, in our house, there are five of us and there are four of us who are that person, so my poor wife gets it from, from everybody, and she's a good sport. But then when her mom comes, her mom's a screamer. And, uh, and so my kids know, like, man, Grandma Lou, you can get her good to the point that I've threatened them of, you're going to kill your grandmother. You've got to stop it. You, like one of them jumped out from when you come up our stairs. We've got a little banister, and they jumped behind it while she was at the top of the stairs. I'm like, you're, Grandma's going to fall. Please stop. Please we will blame you for the rest of your life if you do that. Like, you can't, you know, but, but we all have that. But what happens when you're the one who gets scared? In that moment, you completely forget everything else you were doing. Right? You might have been on your way to a certain project, a certain task, but for a moment, it might just last five seconds. It might last five minutes, depending on how much they scared you. But there is this moment where all you're focused on is what you feel, and then you start asking those questions of like, why did we ever have these kids? Why did I marry him? Uh, my life could have been so much better. You know, and, and you just fixate on the fear and the, the source of the fear. Now, the same thing happens in our lives when we give into a spirit of fear in more serious things. So, so one of the things that a season like this in our nation, in our world, can cause us to evaluate is if, if my whole world has stopped and all I do is read stories about the coronavirus and make posts about the coronavirus and talk to my friends about the coronavirus and watch the same news stories over and over and over and over again about the coronavirus – and I'm spending more time doing all those things than I am pursuing the actual mission of my life that God has called me to. If I'm spending more time refreshing my news app than I am in my Bible app, if I'm spending more time talking to others about my worries than I am praying about them, if I'm spending more time thinking what is the worst case scenario and just screenshotting everything and texting it to all of my family, just stirring stuff up all the time, if I'm spending all my time doing that and not actually focusing on what I'm doing, what I'm supposed to be doing, then it, it reveals a couple things to us. First of all, it reveals we've become uh, captive to a spirit of fear. Secondly, it reveals that, that maybe we are not giving our life to a big enough mission. Because if you're really committed to what God has called you to do, then you are very aware of what's going on and you're staying engaged with how it affects you. But you also know I can't stop and worry about things I can't control because God has given me stuff to do over here that is so important it requires my attention. 
So I've got to keep investing in my relationships. I've got to keep showing up to work. I've got to keep pursuing the vocation God has put on my heart. I've got to keep offering forgiveness and seeking reconciliation in these relationships. I've got to keep telling my neighbors about Jesus. I've got to keep caring for my kids and taking care of all that God has entrusted to me. But the enemy comes, and and if he can't shut down our mission, he'll just try to distract us from it with fear. So we want to be aware, and this is why Paul tells us, do not fear. The spirit you have been given is not one of fear, because fear does not lead us closer to Jesus or make us more effective ministers for Jesus. It only stops us, impedes us, slows us down. So he says, you have not been given a spirit of fear, but one of power, love, and self-discipline. Now, what's important for us to understand is that Paul is not just giving us uh, kind of fortune cookie advice. He's not saying you need to be more positive. He's not saying you need to make an effort to have a better attitude. Instead, he is making a profound theological statement about why, as followers of Jesus, we do not have to be afraid. Gordon Fee is a well-known New Testament scholar, and he puts it as succinctly as anyone can. In talking about 2 Timothy 1.7, he says, Paul is not referring to some spirit or attitude that God has given us, but to the Holy Spirit of God. So as we read 2 Timothy 1.7 this morning, and we consider what it means for us in our current climate, what we need to understand is Paul is not saying, you need to be a better version of yourself. You need to be a more positive, less fearful version. He's saying literally, as a son, a daughter of God, one who's placed their faith in Christ, the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead now dwells in you. And his spirit, I mean, this is where those other translations are so helpful. His spirit does not make you a coward. His spirit does not make you timid. His spirit does not make you afraid. His spirit comes with power, with love, and with self-discipline. And so he's, he's creating this, this picture for us of the peace that we have in these seasons is not rooted in us, but in the presence of Christ inside of us. This is what Jesus promised us in John chapter 14. He said, I am leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart. And the peace I give is a gift the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. Right, the, the scriptures make it very, very clear to us. God never asks us to do anything he doesn't empower us to do. And so when Paul says, you, don't be afraid, you have not received a spirit of fear. When Jesus says, you're going to have peace, the reason those statements are true is not because of who we are, but because of what God has done for us. He has placed his spirit inside of us. So we can and will have peace in every single circumstance. Now, what that that means for us this morning is if we lack peace, if we're troubled and afraid, the first reflection is a reflection on our relationship with Jesus. So if you have not surrendered your life to him, it is natural for you to be captive to fear, to feel troubled, to be afraid. Because when you're confronted with your mortality, the only answer is, yes, I'm going to die. But when you have placed your faith in Christ, the answer is, yes, I'm going to die. And I believe in his resurrection. And it's his presence inside of us that gives that. So so if you've never made that decision, the good news is you can make that this morning. You can surrender your life to Jesus and begin to experience a new life he offers to you. And, And if we had time to go around the room this morning, most of us who are here who follow Jesus for any length of time at all, we can tell the stories of how the Spirit of God does not make us timid, cowards, or afraid, but instead fills our hearts and our minds and our lives with peace in really difficult situations. And I I could take you back to when I was uh, 21 years old. I was in my senior year of college. Angie and I, uh, we'd been married maybe a year and a half, two years. Um, If you're doing the math, yes, that means I got married really young. So uh, let's move past that. It was a good choice for me. Uh, My kids, that'll be a different talk. But, uh, you know, it, it worked well. And, and life was going really, really good for us. Like we were experiencing the blessing of God in so many areas. School was going well. Our marriage was going well. Our relationships were going well. And then from, um, like I think it was late October to about mid-November of my senior year of college uh, was one of the, the worst three to four weeks of my life. Uh, so, so it started with a, a really close loved one. One of the anchors of our family, one of the anchors of my faith um, died. 
And then about a week after that, um, I, I played basketball in college, and I, I blew out my knee for the second time. And it was a, a career-ending injury. And about a week after that, my parents called and told us they were getting a divorce and uh, things were falling apart at home. And so in three weeks, these three big chunks of my identity were all stripped away. And, and Angie walked with me through that and, and remembers some of those prayers and remembers some of those tears and those conversations. And it was, it, it was and still is one of the, the hardest times of my life. But when I look back at it now, almost 17 years later, I remember the peace more than I remember the pain. Because there was this, it, and it really was, and, and I know many of you, you've been in that season where it feels like the first wave comes and knocks you down and you just kind of get sat back up and here comes the second one and then here comes the third one and you start to wonder, will I ever get up again? But even in that uncertainty, there was this deep underlying peace. That the peace that Paul describes in Philippians that he says, passes understanding. Like it ran deeper than my logic and reason. All I knew was no matter how deep my pain went, his peace ran deeper still. This is what Paul is describing to us when he says, God has not given you a spirit of fear of no matter how deep the circumstances go, no matter how uncertain the world may seem, the power and presence of Christ always runs deeper and always brings peace. You see, peace is the... It, it, peace and fear don't coexist together. They just don't. And, and what the scriptures teach us is Jesus comes and he brings his power, he brings his presence, and his perfect love drives out fear. And his perfect love, after it drives it out, then stands guard over our hearts and minds to preserve the peace that he's brought. And I know some of you, you have suffered more and greater and been in darker valleys than I ever have and I don't ever want to be. But I know from your stories At the bottom of it, you found a well of peace that went deeper still. And it's so important for us to remember in seasons like this, because fear not only shrinks our view of God, but fear also causes us to lose some historical perspective. And and fear tells us whatever we're facing right now actually is the worst thing that anyone has ever faced anywhere. But if we'll stop and just be aware, we will know not only personally and corporately in this community, but collectively as humanity, we have been in darker nights and God has still been good and God has still provided. And as people of the resurrection, we are always remembering death is not the end. We don't grieve as those who mourn and we do not experience difficulty in the same way as those who do not have faith in Christ. And so Paul is is trying to help us understand, look, God's spirit does not make you a coward. It does not make you timid. It does not make you fearful. Instead, what does it do? The spirit comes and he says he brings power, he brings love, and he brings self-discipline. So let's walk through those really quickly and, and kind of make some applications to where we are. So first of all, God's spirit comes and it's a spirit of power. Right? Again, 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 the New Testament, the arrival of the Holy Spirit is described as the arrival of power. Romans 8, Paul tells us the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead now dwells in you. He tells us later that that the one who is in us, the spirit in us, is greater than any spirit that's in the world. Jesus tells us in, in Acts that when the spirit comes, he will give us power. Again and again and again, we're reminded of the power of God and that his power is always greater than anything we face. So, so here's what that means for us today. Regardless of where you fall, right, from very panicked and afraid to this is ridiculous, it's like canceling school for an inch of snow. Right? I don't know where you fall on there, and honestly, it doesn't matter. Because for us as followers of Christ, what we're going to remember is this isn't the first season of uncertainty, and it will not be the last. But the power of Christ in us and working through us provides all that we need to continue to build his kingdom, continue to experience peace, continue to experience joy. So we are not going to be people who lose our minds every time some new uncertainty pops up. But we are going to rest and rely on the power of the Holy Spirit in us. But that spirit of power, Paul says, is also a spirit of love. And that's really for us to understand as well. Jesus tells us that the world will know we're his disciples because of our love for each other, the way we talk to each other, the way we treat each other, the way we care for each other. 
Okay, so, so this is what we, what we need to understand where we are right now. So for some of us, we like that last part about the spirit of power and not being afraid, you're nailing that, right? And, and you know you are because that's why you're here this morning of, yeah, I'm not afraid. I'm not worried about this, okay? Now, if we only have power, sometimes we come off like a jerk, right? Because it can be easy to come off like that, man, I'm not getting sick. Come here, I'll hug you right now. You hug me. I'll stand right here. Everybody can shake my hand, right? You can do it. I'll eat your ice cream cone after you. I don't care, right? I've got power. And then, but that example of, of maybe faith, maybe hubris can kind of lead you then into the spot of, of looking down your spirit empowered nose at someone else. Well, all you people watching online. This is where the real Christians are. If you'd hang out with us, maybe, you know, and, and it's a disregard. It is an unloving response because it doesn't take you into account. Like we have members of our church who, who have suffered all winter long with respiratory illnesses, who are following the advice of their doctors, the requests of their family, and they're staying home. And the last thing they need is for you or I to come piling on with the statements of if you just had a little bit more faith, if you wouldn't watch the news so much, you could just come out here with the, re- it's not, it's not loving. You know, so, so we're going to respond in love to each other, even when we disagree with each other. Now, the other part of being a loving person means for some of us, it's for some of us who are a little more afraid, who do tend to kind of embrace the drama of the moment, right? Who, who love, honestly, the hysteria a little bit, who love the conspiracy theories, right? Who, who love to read the worst case scenarios and warn everyone. Like you feel, you're, if you're an Enneagram person, you're the six, okay? So you, you're just, you love to be, you want to be the watchman on the wall. That's just, that's what you feel your job is. And, and, and though you think you're being loving, oftentimes you're not. You know, and, and so for some of us, the best, most loving thing we can do this week is shut up. Just stop talking, right? Stop posting, stop texting, stop forwarding. Stop watching the news 24 hours a day, right? Stop be thinking you're a medical expert. Like we know you were a constitutional expert three weeks ago, and now you're a medical expert. But if you could lay all your expertise down and just get back to your job, just do the things you're supposed to do. And if you, if you don't know, right, because sometimes we, we just don't know what we don't know. Some of us this morning, we are that person and we have no idea. So here's a very simple way for you to determine. Ask a friend, family member, or coworker, do you think it would be a good idea for me to stop watching the news and get off social media and stop emailing and texting? They say yes before you have finished the sentence. You need to stop right? Because it's just too much. If you're uncertain, I mean, there are people around the room that are your friends on social media and they can tell you. Your friends in real life, they can tell you. And it's not, don't take it as condemnation. Don't take it offensively. Just take it as like, okay, I can be more loving. And, and one of the ways I can be more loving is just to knock it off for a season. It's Paul, what's Paul telling us? The spirit God gives you, his spirit is a spirit of power, but it's also a spirit of love. So we're going to speak the truth in love. We're going to offer care in love. We're going to live out our faith with love. We're going to be gentle with those who have weaker faith. We're going to be gentle with those who, who physically are weaker. We're going to be gentle with those who, whose hearts are full of fear. We're going to be gentle and loving towards those who do not have a relationship with Christ because they should be terrified. And instead of us saying, stop being a chicken, we're going to say, let me tell you why I have peace. And we're going to do it gently, and we're going to do it with love, and Jesus is going to use it to lead other people into a relationship with him. So the spirit God gives us is always and forever a spirit of love. And then the last thing Paul tells us is he gives us a spirit, and it brings self-discipline. Right? Some, some passages say self-discipline, self-control, um, sound mind, good judgment. All of them are are pointing to the idea that the supernatural presence of the Spirit of God inside of you is going to have a real-world practical outworking in the way you live every single day. The Holy Spirit is going to inspire the decisions and the choices you make, especially in seasons of uncertainty and in times when other people are afraid. 
So, so what does that mean for us? It means as Christians, if the Spirit fills us with good judgment and a sound mind and self-control, then when people are worried about viruses and epidemics and pandemics, our response is going to be to follow the basic protocols that are being outlined for us. We're going to wash our hands. We're going to stay home when we're sick. All right, we're, we're going to just be aware of some basic guidelines. If you want to know what we're doing at Christian Chapel, you can look on the, the homepage of the website. You can pick up a copy when you leave this morning. Uh, you can look on social media. We posted it there. If you're still allowed to be on social media after today, that's yet to be determined. Um, but but you, can, you can do all these things. And what you'll find is there are just some practical steps we're taking. And we're doing this because we feel like the Spirit has led us, because we feel like it's a loving response. And and I know some of those practical, common sense steps are offensive to some of us. I've heard from a couple of you this morning of, I hate coming to church and not being able to hug people. I hate that I can't shake hands. I don't know what to do when I talk to somebody. Right? You're like, I, what do I do? What they, and your hands just, they're floating out here. You have no idea what to do. Like, just put them down, okay? Put them, if you don't know what to do, put them in your pockets. And then you just talk to people. Now, extroverts, I get it. This is a whole new world for you. You've never been this way before. Introverts, you're loving it. You're like, a guy caught me after first service, like, best Sunday I've ever been to. Nobody touched me. I didn't have to endure a hug or a handshake. He said, next week, if you could arrange it to where we can't talk to each other, that would be even better. Right? So, so we're just going gonna to understand God has made us differently. And in seasons like this, some changes affect others of us more than others. But that's fine. We're just going to exercise sound judgment. So we're going to be aware of what's being recommended. We're going to do our best to follow the guidelines that are being put forth. And at the same time, we don't want to embrace the hysteria. We don't want, to, don't want to kind of make it worse than it is. We don't want to blow it out of proportion. But, you know, for us at Christian Chapel, like we've had four different versions of what today is going to look like. We had one plan on Wednesday. We had another on Thursday. We had another on Friday. We had another on Saturday. And, and depending on what this week holds, we might have another one the week or two after that. But, but no matter what happens, I mean, if, if this is the last Sunday that we're able to meet live in person, I don't know if it is or if it isn't, but we're going to use sound judgment. We're going to follow the leading and the guiding of the Holy Spirit. We're going to trust God's ability to speak specifically to us about the context of our community and what it looks like not only to be loving Christians, but also to be good citizens. And what, what enables us to provide the best witness to our world? And then we're going to follow that course of action that God lays out for us. Right? So, so we don't want to swing to the other end of like, well, hey, God's given me sound judgment. and I'm such a person of faith. I'm not changing a single thing that I do. Right? Because you, you kind of run the risk of, of you become like the snake handling churches. I don't know if you've ever been to those. I haven't. They're weird, Right? Or they, I saw this, uh, saw this meme, this little video on, online the other day. It might have been one of you who posted it. I don't know. Um, but this, in this case, it's good. Like, thank you for doing it because it, it provided me with a sermon illustration. So um, it, was, um, it was this little girl, and she was like at a, an amusement park, I think. Uh, but she was clearly standing in line, and it was one of those places where the, the lines are kind of, it's corral style, you know, so it's got the metal poles, uh, top and bottom. And she was just at like face height with the top pole. And in the video, she had kind of, I think she had her hands on both sides, but she definitely had her mouth open, and she definitely had her tongue out, and she was going like the six-foot length of that, just licking it all the way up and all the way back, right? And the the title of it was Kids Are Gross. Uh, And and so obviously, like, we see that and think, oh, that's bad parenting. Um, That girl's probably dead now. Uh, like we don't, we don't know what happened to her. Uh, but, but we, in a season like this, we're not going to be that guy either, right? We're not going to be that girl either. We're not going to be the one of like, hey, don't worry about it. It's not a problem. I'm not going to get it. I'm young and healthy. I'll be fine. We want to live with an awareness of everything we do affects someone else. And so we're going to be sensitive to it. We're going to live without fear, but we're also going to live with power and we're going to live with love and we're going to live with self, self-discipline, with self-control, with a sound mind, with good judgment, because this is what the Spirit produces in us. And as Christians, when we dedicate ourselves to living this way, it enables us to live free of fear, 
and to stay focused on the mission God has given to us, which regardless of the details of your life is to advance his kingdom in every single situation you find yourselves in. So this morning, I want to leave you with a thought from C.S. Lewis because every evangelical pastor knows that C.S. Lewis always says it better than you do, right? Um, And he said something about everything, so you can always find his thoughts on it. So in 1948, uh, C.S. Lewis wrote a, a real short essay on a Christian response to the atomic age. So this is, uh, you know, just a couple years after the U.S. has dropped uh, nuclear bombs on Japan to end World War II, hundreds of thousands of people have been killed in a moment. Uh, and the, the years that come, there's the proliferation of nuclear arms in Russia, nuclear arms in the United States, and C.S. Lewis lives in Britain. So he is in the, the zone of, of coming from both directions. And in 1948 in, in Great Britain, there was a lot of fear around what this new technology meant and a lot of conversation. It probably felt a lot like the last week has felt for us, right? Where, where it's just everywhere you turn and everywhere you look, this is the conversation that's going on. And so Lewis gives us this advice. And as I, I read through it, I would just encourage you, replace atomic age with coronavirus, And just listen to the the wisdom of those who've come before us. Lewis says, It is perfectly ridiculous to go about whimpering and drawing long faces because the scientists have added one more chance of a painful and premature death to a world which already bristled with such chances and in which death itself was not a chance at all, but a certainty. This is the first point to be made and the first action to be taken is to pull ourselves together. If we are all going to be destroyed by an atomic bomb, let that bomb, when it comes, find us doing sensible and human things. Praying, working, teaching, reading, listening to music, bathing the children, playing tennis, chatting with our friends over a pint, he was British, and a game of darts. (laughs) Not huddled together like frightened sheep and thinking about bombs. They may break our bodies, A microbe can do that, but they need not dominate our minds, right? And and this is where we find ourselves this morning of, hey, there there are some real reasons to be concerned. There's some real things that we don't know how it ends, but as, as followers of Jesus, we are going to embrace his spirit inside of us. And his spirit does not make us timid, does not make us cowards, does not give in to fear, but it reminds us the same power that raised Christ from the dead now dwells in me that the love of Christ compels me to treat others in loving ways and that he gives me the ability to exercise sound judgment in every situation. So if you'll stand with me, I want you to join me in a a few prayers and then the band's gonna lead us in a final song this morning. If you'll bow your heads and close your eyes, we're gonna pray um, for people who are sick. We're gonna pray for people who are scared. We're gonna pray for our government officials and our medical professionals. And then we're going to pray for all of you who are here today who are in any form of decision-making capacity. As a a parent, as a teacher, an administrator, a boss, an employer, a small business owner, uh, the the effects of the the events of the last week have far-reaching consequences. And I know for many of you, it's a source of stress and uncertainty over the future. So we're going to pray that the Spirit invades all of these areas and brings His light and His life. Will you join me in those, Lord? We come. And first of all, we pray for those who are sick and those who are suffering around the world today. We ask, Lord, for your healing to be released in hospital rooms and in homes. We pray for this this virus to end, for the spread to stop, for it to, to not just be contained, but to be eliminated entirely. Jesus, we believe that your miracle working power is not limited to our one-on-one prayers with individuals who are sick, but can be released to everyone everywhere. So that's what we ask this morning, Lord, that your healing would come. And Lord, we continue to pray as well for our government officials, for our medical professionals, for those that you have entrusted with wisdom, with knowledge, and with authority in these situations. We pray, Lord, for those of them that are believers, that they would be full of the good judgment your spirit brings, that they would make decisions based off the data they've been given, but inspired by the spirit to interpret it accordingly. We pray, Lord, for those who are not followers of you, that your spirit would still lead, direct, and guide so that your kingdom will come and your will will be accomplished. Lord, we pray for every parent that's in the room this morning that you would give us wisdom in the way we talk about this with our small children, with our kids at home. 
Help us to have an awareness that that we're establishing patterns in their hearts and in their minds for how they deal with fear and uncertainty. So help us to act and react as mothers and fathers of faith, pointing our kids towards your divine activity and your divine care. Lord, I pray for those who are teachers, who are school administrators, who are district officials, for the decisions they have to make in the days and weeks ahead. We pray for those who are in charge at work, who have uh, decisions regarding bosses. We pray for all of us, Lord, who might be affected by the choices that other people make. Lord, regardless of what may come, we choose to place our faith, our trust, our hope in you. We believe you are our provider. We believe you are the one who's with us every step of the way. And we ask, Lord, that in difficult situations, we would sense the power of your spirit. You would give us the ability to have a sound mind and exercise good judgment for the betterment of our society and for the advance of your kingdom. Lord, we lay down our plans and our agendas to you and we pray that your kingdom would come and your will would be accomplished on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. The band's gonna lead us in a final song this morning. As they do, if if you're in a spot today where you need to say yes to Jesus for the first time, we'd love to pray those prayers. If fear plagues your heart or there are other things you're wrestling and battling, you can head out the back doors and to your left to the prayer room. Our prayer team will be ready to meet with you to pray those personal and powerful prayers. The rest of us, we're gonna sing this song as just a reminder that our souls are at rest because of who Jesus is.
go with confidence. It is well with your soul because Christ resides there. It's his spirit that makes a difference. It's his spirit that changes the outlook and the outcome of every situation. So as we go, may we go not only with hearts full of faith, but with eyes ready to look, ears ready to hear, mouths ready to speak, hands ready to respond to the opportunities God gives us this week to share the gospel with those who desperately need to hear it. May you go in his faith and his peace. Our home groups will meet as normal this morning or this evening. So uh, parents, uh, everything will be thoroughly clean before your kids come back for their groups this evening. We would love to see you there if you are if you're up for joining us. May you go in God's grace, go in his peace, go in his confidence.